US senators in a last minute vote passed a spending bill that averted the shutdown of some government departments. Now this was part of the finalizing of the budget that has become a very politicized affair. The bill's future became uncertain due to pressures from a group of Republicans who wanted spending cuts across the board. Of course, the crisis overall is not over yet as several more departments' budgets are yet to be voted on and we can expect more fireworks in the coming days. We talked to Anish about this. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, government shutdowns have become quite a common thing in the United States. The possibility of it every year, there is a frantic you know, round of negotiations that takes place for weeks uh, ahead of this. So, could you tell us about the latest spending bill? What, what was it about? Why was... Why was it a threat, so to speak, to the functioning of the U.S. government? We can have debates about whether the government is functioning at all, but nonetheless, how? Yeah, so what we're looking at is about uh, close to a half a trillion dollar uh, budget. Essentially, it's a budget uh, that is going to uh, be used in pretty much uh, every major thing that not just runs the U.S. government, but also a large part of the United States as well. Funding for housing, transportation, veteran care, pensions, whole host of things that require funding, uh, you know, and it should have started, should have been done and enacted by October 1st. Uh, but uh, we had, uh, you know, we have a very, uh, a very uh, a problematic and obstacle ridden Congress right now, which uh, pretty much tries to hold hostage uh, millions of Americans every uh, angle they get. And primarily it is obviously the Republicans are at fault here. Uh, but nevertheless, the Democrats do not really uh, push for anything substantial either. So what we often have is uh, weeks of negotiations. It's not that every year there is a, a timely enactment of the spending bills. Uh, very often it goes until September, sometimes November. But uh, the fact that it has uh, delayed so far at, and for so long, uh, essentially going into pretty much one half, uh, close to one half of a financial year, uh, U.S. financial aid clearly shows that the U.S. Uh, government, the Congress, is becoming more and more polarized on a whole host of issues. A small group of Republicans right now have significant control uh, by holding hostage a whole lot of things that are essential for the government, and not just government, uh, but also like for the people of the United States, many of whom depend on a large amount of these funding to actually make things work for their lives. And let's also talk about the uh, the amount of the budget here. Uh, what we're looking at is a substantially smaller number than the defense bill that was passed much earlier. Obviously, that that too had its own set of controversies, but right now it is set to run close to about $900 billion. So what we're looking at is pretty much half of that, about a $460 billion of budget uh, for things that are essential for Americans, while the war machine gets funded, uh, uh, you know, with bipartisan support. And it, this clearly shows the priorities of the U.S. Congress, the U.S. leadership as a whole, who are far more keen on getting the defense budgets passed. And uh, even right now, the bigger uh, controversy and the bigger debate is about the $100, $120 billion or so of additional spending in, uh, you know, military uh, for to aid uh, Ukraine and uh, Israel's war machines. So pretty much uh, the whole debate right now, the U.S. national debate, is being centered around funding uh, war machines and not whether or not they should be funded, but how by how much they should be funded. So it is... Clearly, the priorities are all wrong at this point, uh, where essentials are not as prioritized as, you know, the military budgets. Right, Anish, of course, now coming uh, further to that point, how do you also see this as a kind of reflection of the sort of uh, dysfunction of the political structure itself, uh, considering how the two-party system has evolved, the fact that now, uh, you know, uh, cri crisis or this kind of uh, sense of being stuck seems to be default as far as U.S. Congress is concerned. Yes, so obviously the this was this is nothing new, but over the past decade or so, we have seen far more such confrontations between the two parties, but mostly around things that really don't affect most of the people. Like, for instance, a big part of the opposition for even this current spending bill uh, is that uh, the Republicans, a, la a large number of Republicans were arguing that it is too much uh, to spend uh, on, you know, basic essentials, uh, that there should be a trimming down of budget. Uh, even though the the military spending remains untouched, 
it pretty much goes through far much smoothly than any other uh, debates that we are seeing. But uh, the fact that you know spending on housing, spending on transportation, spending on infrastructure, things that are quite necessary uh, are not really given the same. Uh, value that uh, among the uh, the U.S. leadership, and it clearly shows that like far more vested interests are in control. Uh, like it clearly shows the failure of U.S. democracy, which where lobbying money has more influence than actual votes, uh, where leaderships are far more cut off the, uh, from you know people's aspirations, their needs, their wants, uh, than they are to say corporate money and their uh, interests that they pretty much represent in the U.S. Congress. So much of the debates pretty much surround on. Uh, you know, bills and resolutions or, you know, proposals that affect and impact corporations. Like when they talk about border control, it is going to go into private corporations that include the prison system, the defense system, the private, uh, you know, arms uh, industry. But none of that really affects uh, when it comes to stuff like transportation or housing. These are not, these are going into people's coffers. So because money is not coming from there to lobby for that, you do not have that interest being represented as well. So this clearly shows, like, obviously the oligarchy is powerful, but it is just the nitty gritties of how they want to control the uh, US system uh, that pretty much divides them, not the whether or not they want to represent people's aspirations. Ranish, thank you so much for the update, but do stay back. We'll come to a country which the US has an outsized influence on in the next story. Our next story is from the Korean Peninsula where South Korea's Unification Ministry has come up with a new plan for bringing the two countries together. The new plan is the first review of the department's agenda since 1994. Now this is a significant development since tensions have been on the rise in the region since the right-wing government of Yoon suk yeol took office in Seoul. North Korea meanwhile has also taken a strong stand on this issue in previous months. We go back to Anish for some details on the story. Welcome back, Anish. So, a uh, new document, a new plan by South Korea's reunification ministry this time. We'll come to the North Korean side uh, in the next question. But what is this plan, the first revision in, uh, I believe, almost 30 years uh, to uh, what the reunification means for South Korea? Yes. So, the current plan is quite interesting because it is pretty much a departure from the existing set of plans that have always informed uh you know south korean governments in the past uh right now what we're looking at is a very uh vague sort of set of uh formulations you do not really see a clear blueprint of what they want to how how they want to achieve uh unification of the korean peninsula but uh, if you look at some of the values that they're trying to present which is like the value of human freedom or, you know, reunification and democracy, uh, it's pretty much a cover for a whole host of other uh, things that the the conservative South Korean government wants to do. We must remember the history of reunification or the debate around reunification. The conservatives in the South have been the biggest opponents of that because they often fe felt that earlier uh, understanding and structure or debates around reunification have always been uh, in favor of the communist. That's how they looked at it, because uh, reunification meant reconciliation, meant, uh, you know, forming a, a loose confederation with the North in some ways as a, uh, you know, as a goal, and through that achieve reunification. The whole point was to reconcile with the war that actually divided the Korean Peninsula and to create a stable, peaceful system that can actually work for both sides. That is not something that the conservatives ever wanted. They always, uh, you know, opposed reunification whenever it was uh, brought up, including during the, you know, the last peace process, the conservatives were the biggest opponents of the entire peace process. So their reunification plan has nothing, has no talks about, you know, how to achieve peace. They're talking about peace, but peace based on, you know, uh, expanding democracy or expanding uh, liberty. This is the kind of idea that they're seeing, which is pretty much a mask of saying that they want to essentially invade at some level North Korea and, you know, uh, bring it under the pretty much, uh, you know, a liberal uh, electoral system that the South Koreans have. And that is definitely just an attempt to stoke uh, some level of nationalism and also in some ways attract or maybe shed 
their anti-reunification stand that they've had in the past, considering the fact that the elections are quite near. And you know, we are actually sitting on a very uh, interesting point in time when it comes to you know the Korean, the trajectory of Korean War, which hasn't, which technically continues to this day. Uh, that in this whole process, what we're looking at is that the North, which was always called for reunification, even if it meant making concessions to the government in the South. Uh, is now against it. And while the South right now is trying to present itself as pro-reunification by actually making uh, statements or, you know, the plan actually showing that they want to essentially expand uh, democracy, which essentially means that they want to pretty much break down the North Korean government. They want to expand the propaganda machinery, uh, saying that they want to uh, enlighten the people of North uh, of the North to against their government, uh, against the human rights violations and what 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 not, uh, pretty much uh, t- telling us that there will be enough government funded propaganda machinery against the North that will be operating within North Korea. So that clearly shows that this is a more confrontational policy than any kind of uh, idea than any idea of reunification that pretty much inform uh, reunification uh, advocates in the past. Well, Anish, also quickly, let's take, could you tell us a bit about how North Korea has been approaching this issue? It also made some recent announcements about the issue of reunification as well. Yes, that's, as I said, like, it's a very uh, interesting, but also kind of tragic times that we are living in where the North has pretty much given up. Like, we have reached a point where the North has given up on reunification as an ultimate goal. It also looks at uh, the South as an enemy entity. Now, uh, it is trying to uh, move uh, any relations with the South, uh, the Southern government uh, from the reunification ministry, which no longer exists, to the department that now handles foreign affairs, uh, clearly showing that it is going to see it as an alien and a foreign and an obviously enemy state or a, a hostile state uh, to the north and clearly showing that this hostility has reached a very problematic stage and we meet, we must keep reminding our viewers that peace was pretty much very close to reach just a few years ago and it was derailed uh, not just by the conservatives in the south uh, like the Yoon Suk Yeol government but also even under the Moon Jae-in government that pushed for the peace process uh, because of the interventions by the United States. So the whole peace process was possible. It was possible. And it could have actually created reconciliation on a long-term basis. But that has all been der- derailed right now because, you know, the government, the conservatives here, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, the beleaguered conservative government wants to regain whatever lost popularity that it has uh, lost over the past couple of years. Uh, because of his misadministration and also because the empire wants the South to keep, be more belligerent with the North right now. Thank you so much, Anish, for the update. And that's all in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a new episode on Monday. Meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.